Good morning, everyone. Joining us for the live stream of the message today, this Sunday, October 2nd. The message title is Being Right, Right. I also want to remind uh, those tuning in that uh, we will be celebrating the Lord's table this morning. So if you'd like to partake in communion with us at the end of the message, make sure you have a little something to eat and drink. The requirements, I remind the congregation here, are, are not uh, my requirements. Of course, you're not here physically, but you are here at the Lord's table in spirit. But the only requirement that I know that Christ would require of you is that you have accepted him as Lord and Savior. The scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It's a lengthy reading, but and I won't be going in deep for the whole 26 verses of John chapter 4, but it's a story. And there's some certain little pieces of that story that I really want to drive home near the end of the message. John chapter 4, starting at verse 1. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was back gaining and baptizing more disciples than John the Baptist. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, it was his disciples. So they left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So we came to a town in Samaria called Shachar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman, she said to him. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would give you living water. Sir, the woman replied, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus told her, Go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus says, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is that you've had five husbands, and the man you are now with is not your husband. What you have said is, Quite right. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you do. You claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and, and now has come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they're the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask, Lord, this morning that through your spirit, that you would write your message upon our hearts and souls. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Early in the week, as it often happens, my heart and mind begin to churn about what to preach on next week. Sometimes, of course, it's a struggle to know just exactly what to speak about. But early last week, I read a quote, to be kind is more important than to be right. Hear that again. To be kind is more important 
than to be right. That was the first of a number of things that I ran into early in the week concerning being right. And it seemed every time I turned around, there was something telling me to talk and speak about being right. Now, we all can easily likely admit that we always want to be right. And some of you no doubt are. Yes. But we're not always right. And when we're faced with a question that, and feel that we need to weigh in on it, if we comment, we're likely thinking that we're right in our opinion. And sometimes, though, we might even be cautious and say, I may not be right, but... And then we continue on with this uncertain opinion, which in our minds, we're right. Do I hear an amen? Most of all that chatter you're hearing in the background is coming from the women. Just say it. With all these things that we encounter in life, it appears that there are more and more topics to talk about that we think that we're right about. And of course, as we've learned even more so in the last couple of years, not everyone agrees with us and what we think is right. It's in these circumstances that we need to afford people at the very least some common grace. And like that quote that I shared earlier, to be kind is more important than to be right. All too often in our relationships, they can be damaged severely or broken completely because we don't agree with what others think about a whole host of different topics. Now, I've learned that a lot of time it's not worth arguing about. We got, you know, to let some stuff slide. But adding to that thought, if we're smart, we're going to listen. We're going to listen more to these other opinions. And we all know that we've been proven wrong before. And what we know or what we thought we knew was wrong until we come to the truth. Being wrong is okay so long as we find the truth and we've learned. As believers in Christ, we should be cautious of what we're willing to go to battle over. And maybe we've learned some of these lessons in the last couple of years. But there's, there's times where we can't afford to back down. And I'm not saying we just, you know, sit and argue with others that don't share the same beliefs that we have in God or Christ. But one could say that we can try and reason. It's not arguing. We're going to try and reason with people who don't share our beliefs in God. We don't need to be right about many things that we come up against. But as individual humans, when all is said and done, there is one topic, one subject that we need to get right. So is being right, right? And that topic, that subject is concerning Jesus Christ. Nothing else matters. Our decision to accept Jesus, of course, was and is the right thing to do. And if we're to share Jesus with others and they reject that message, our being right, because we are, our being right is right. And this, this is the battle that we're going to come up against where our being right is non-negotiable. Now, I sure shared this story from John's Gospel where Jesus is dealing with a Samaritan woman. And most of you likely know the Jews and Samaritans, they're enemies. It's a religious and ancient split between Jews and Samaritans, and the Samaritans were only partially Jewish. Because they weren't full-blooded Jews, the vast majority of Jewish people, they wouldn't even lower themselves to speak to a Samaritan. To the Jews, the Samaritans were less than human. Well, Jesus... He's creator of all of us. And obviously, he didn't feel the same way about Samaritans. And as he met this woman, he began to talk to her while the disciples are in town shopping at Sobeys. Again, I'm not going to break down the entire reading, but I want to focus on one part where Jesus hits a home run, so to speak, about being right. He's right. And he doesn't back down in the exchange or the session of reasoning. Recapping, Jesus wants a drink. He's thirsty. He's fully human, remember? He gets hungry. He's thirsty. The Samaritan woman comes to draw water. It's noon. It's in the heat of the day. She likely came there in that heat when no one else was around. And Jesus asks her for a drink. So the conversation gets going. 
she knows the man that she's talking to is a Jew, and she's surprised that he even speaks to her. And though Jesus was asking her for something, he had something that she needed. She just didn't know it yet. This well, it's known as Jacob's well. This is where the meeting is taking place. The Samaritans and the Jews, they had the same forefathers. Samaritans believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These are the same patriarchs of Jesus' bloodline for the Jewish people. The woman has something to draw water with, but Jesus doesn't. He wants a drink from the well, but he also offers her water. It's not drinking water, but the water of life. He says, everyone who drinks this water from the well will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, he says, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus is getting deeper now. She's not quite understanding. What water could he give her that she needs that once she has this living water, she won't be thirsty again? Of course, we know this is water in a spiritual way, not a literal water for drinking to quench our thirst. She didn't know that. She was thinking about water to replenish the body, not the soul. She had in her mind that as a Samaritan, she had her belief. She didn't need to share this man's beliefs. She was thinking that she was right about all that she, you know, all that she wanted was this water that Jesus spoke of. So she wouldn't have to keep coming back to that well. Who wouldn't? But up to now, Jesus is just a Jewish man. And Jesus tells her, go call your husband. Bring him back here. And of course, we remember from the story, she, I have no husband. Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You've had five. The one you're with now is not your husband. So now she knows. She knows that Jesus is a prophet. She's likely an outcast because she's been married so time. She's living in sin. She don't dare go get water at the well when everybody else in the cool of the morning or later she goes in the heat of the day. She's likely an outcast in her own Samaritan community. The woman replies, what you have said is quite true. I can see that you're a prophet. But then she continues to preach to Jesus. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Now, if we stop here for a bit. Here's where she, she thinks her worship of the same God is okay. She thinks it's right. Yet when Jesus, this Jewish man that she just met, would tell her she must worship in Jerusalem. That's what the law said. But Jesus is changing up things in the Gospels. Jesus says a time is coming when you will worship the Father. Most Jews wouldn't even tell a Samaritan that, that you will worship the Father because they were below that. Jesus says there's a time coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem. A big change in the law. This is the key verse. He says, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. Get that. You worship what you do not know. But then Jesus says, we worship what we do know. For salvation is from the Jews. All this time, the woman, her people thought that they were okay in their worship. Many people do today. And when you think about it, the Jewish people wouldn't even allow those Samaritans around Jerusalem to worship anyway. But that's not the point. Jesus tells her, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. And we worship what we do know. Jesus is right. He's not backing down. And as Christians, we're to continue our worship of Jesus no matter what. We're not to back down on what Jesus said. If modern society says that this or that isn't sin, but Jesus says it's sin. It's sin. Jesus is right. And if people are calling sin not sin, they're obviously gravely mistaken. Jesus being God in the flesh, he's the only way to God. And when you believe and say that, you are right. When people disagree with that, they are simply wrong because they worship what they do not know. 
just like that poor Samaritan woman that Jesus has met. Oh, she worshiped, but not the way God intended. And these people we meet who won't believe in Jesus, they do. They are worshiping. There'll be more on that in the next few weeks. The folks who are not accepting Jesus as God, they're worshiping already. They had their own gods. There's gods of pride and money. And there's a list a mile long of more human-made gods that have become their gods. And in these cases, is our being right? Right? Yes, it is. But we don't need to fight and argue with those who, who don't agree with us. We need to be kind and be graceful. Continue to pray that the Lord will open their eyes like Jesus had opened up the mind and the eyes of this Samaritan woman. Because Jesus in a prophetic comment tells her a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers they're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. These are the kind of worshipers the Father is looking for. It's not Baptist, it's not Catholic, it's not Pentecostal. God is spirit and his worshipers must spirit uh, worship in spirit and truth. And then the woman says, the Samaritan woman, I know the Messiah is coming, the one they call the Christ. He's coming and he'll explain everything to us. And Jesus plainly tells her, that's me. Now, this is a game changer for her. She then realizes she's talking to the Christ, the Messiah. This means that salvation and help. This Savior is even going to help me, a despised Samaritan woman, who's even despised by our own people. As individual Christians, we're not always right, but all the things that we think we know. But when it comes to belief in God, Jesus and his Holy Spirit, the one true living God, he exists, he's created us, he has saved us. Through his sacrifice, he's returning to take us to eternal life. These are the core Christian beliefs that we are absolutely 100% right in believing these facts. Don't waver, don't back down. We've been guided into this relationship with God through his Holy Spirit. And we can't go wrong if we stick to that relationship that we have with God through Jesus. In spirit and in truth, we worship. I know. And I know for you, it seems unsettling at times that we can't always prove to non-believers with a test tube or with science, or with this, or with that. We can't always prove that God is there. It's unsettling at times because we, in our beliefs, in our faith, we struggle sometimes. We may even have doubts. That makes us nervous, especially when we're bombarded with anti-God attitudes from the whole rest of the world. These unbelievers that we come up against, they haven't met Jesus at the well so to speak. They worship what they don't know. And it shouldn't surprise us when they think that they're right while they're living without the truth. We've come to know God and we've come to believe in him and his word because we've come to know him through his spirit. This is the living water that Jesus spoke of. We've tasted the goodness of God who refreshes us in our spirit he renews our strength and he helps maintain our beliefs and our faith. As weak little reeds that we are, we don't need to be ashamed of being right when it comes to our beliefs in the one true living God. We worship God in spirit and in truth. How do we do that? Without God's spirit, we wouldn't have been able to recognize or state our beliefs. Unbelievers cannot praise God. It takes the saving faith that God has given us to be able to lift up Christ in praise and thanksgiving. We're meeting at the Lord's table today. And it's here where we commune with one another and with God through his Holy Spirit. There's nothing hocus pocus about it. 
being together is important. I know some of you are not here. You're listening on the, the live stream. It's not always possible. But it is important to be with other believers because we're stronger together as we pray, as we worship, and as we fellowship together. We're right in our decision to follow and seek Christ. And for those of you know, those out there in the world who don't agree with us, we can continue to pray that God will open up their eyes, their heart. Until then, we must meet their unbelief with patience. Yeah. Patience and common grace. We can reason with them to a point, but there's no sense of arguing or, or letting things get so out of hand that we end up losing a relationship where we don't have the opportunity to share Christ with them one more day down the road in the future, maybe. Is being right, right? Is it always the most important thing? Not always. But when it comes to our belief in God as creator, our savior and sustainer, you and I are right. It's the most important decision and topic in all of life to be right about. We need to stand firm in our faith, in the faith that we have. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us. We may take it for granted, Lord, but it's no small thing that we've accepted you. When though so much of the world is anti-Christ and anti-God, anti-religion, and here we are, some 2,000 years after you died for our sins, Jesus. Here we are. We struggle in our faith. We struggle in a foreign land. We're aliens here, not really belonging here. Encourage us, Lord. Feed our faith. Encourage us to feed our faith through the reading of your word and the fellowship with other believers. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are mourning the loss of loved ones for those who are in the hospital and in long-term care, those who are in palliative care, Lord, we pray for all. Give one each the strength for the journeys they face and use us, Lord, to be part of the answers to those prayers as we share our faith in what is right. We praise you and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. As we gather around the Lord's table this morning, I'd ask the uh, servers to come forward. And if you're at home or wherever you may be tuning into the live stream, just having a little sip of something with you and something to eat as you can share as we observe the Lord's table. Let us give thanks for the table. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this table that you've prepared for us. But so long ago as you ate it with your disciples, you commanded them to do this in remembrance of me. That is you. So we gather around the table this morning with drink and bread. We gather remembering that this is your body that was broken, your blood shed for us that we may live. So we give you thanks for this, Lord, not that we've done anything, that our good works are anything. It's because of what you have done that we can be here. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. A scripture reading from Matthew chapter 26. While they were eating, Jesus took bread gave thanks and broke it, gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
I tell you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. When they had come to him, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Jesus is the bread. Bread is a sustainer of physical life. Whatever it is on our tables each and every day, we need to consume physical food to maintain our physical life. Jesus tells us in the, in the Gospels that he is the bread of life. And just like in this story from the Samaritan woman at the well, yes, we need physical drink as well. We need water to sustain our physical bodies, but we also need this water likened unto the Holy Spirit to indwell us. He is breaking bread, symbolizing his broken body for each and every one of us. Soon after Jesus would have met that woman at, at the well, the Samaritan woman, which the Jewish people detested. Jesus would be laying down his life for not only Jews, but for that Samaritan woman. The sinful Samaritan woman who was despised by her own people. Jesus was laying down his life and allowing his body to be broken for all. Not just North America or Western Europe for all. And Christ taking that cup, the contents symbolizing his blood, washing away our sins as we accept Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, we are cleansed. But we need daily cleansing. If you reread the story of the Last Supper in the Gospels, Jesus is washing the feet of the disciples and he comes to Peter. I don't want you to wash my feet, not you. You're my Lord. You can't wash my feet. Jesus says, if I can't wash your feet, you have no part of me. You've already had a bath. You just need a little tidying up. Wash my feet. Wash my hands. No pun intended. Daily cleansing. We have forgiveness through the blood of Jesus Christ, but we need to be in daily prayer and confession for our sins. Servers, would you please serve?
us pray. Heavenly Father, the bread that we're about to consume, we recognize this Lord is your body, broken for us. As we consume this, Lord, bless us to our bodies. Help us to remember constantly, Lord, what you have gone through for us. And as we share in the cup, Lord, we ask a blessing upon this as well. As we drink this, symbolizing your blood, Lord, that our bodies, our hearts and souls and spirits have been cleansed and we come for cleansing, Lord. And we are spotless in your sight. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The bread, the body of Christ, eat of it and give thanks. the blood of Christ shed that we may live, drink of it and give thanks. As the custom of when the disciples were finished with their meal. They went out to Mount of Olives after they had sung a hymn. Let's stand together here in the congregation. We'll sing the first verse of Blessed Be the Ties to the Bible. Blessed be the ties that bind our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred ties is life to that Heavenly Father, bless us as we go. Protect us, Lord, in our travels near and far. Protect those, Lord, of our families and loved ones, our friends. Bring us back again safely. We make this prayer in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we ask your blessing on each one, and that may our lives be according to your will, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Blessings on your week, each and every one of you, and don't forget, we need daily cleansing. <laughs>